Um, I, I'm looking forward to our study tonight as uh, we uh, look at gentle and lowly. We're looking at uh, the chapters on Jesus as our friend and the Holy Spirit as well. And uh, just reading through those this week, I think it'll be a profitable discussion because it is nice weather outside. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to take advantage of it. And uh, there should be enough sunshine for all of us to read our books, have a good discussion. So if you have a favorite lawn chair, if you don't bring one, we have lots of chairs here. We'll just take them outside. Um, but we can enjoy uh, the outdoors and uh, fellowship with one another as we continue that study. Um, with the dumpster, that's kind of an all-day thing. Uh, one of the uh, privileges of me working for Nicholson is that I have uh, privileged access to all their company uh, relations. So um, I can get us a dumpster for a month a lot cheaper than you can for a day. Um, so anyway, uh, we'll have that dumpster. It won't just be that day. Uh, we'll have a clean out on that Saturday. But if you have stuff that you're like, hey, I really can't put this out to the trash, but it needs to get gone. Listen, we got a dumpster, people. Let's get rid of it, okay? So if you need to bring something, I have a truck. If you're like, we need to get this out of the house. We have able-bodied men on the front row here. They will help. Shout out to the to the boys. <laughs> um, so as, uh, as uh, we, we look forward to that, that'll be the third uh, Saturday of this month, in case you didn't catch the date. That's the 19th believe. And then um, just keep in mind, uh, Sharon and Malon uh, this morning, uh, Sharon was able to talk to um, our Sharon uh, Beers uh, this morning. It's kind of fun to have two of those. <laughs> I always have to say Sharon and Malon or Sharon Beers, like one of the two. Um, but Malon's not doing well this morning. He's really struggling. And so just continue to pray for him. Um, he has made a valiant effort to bounce back from his uh, diagnosed paralysis. And so the doctors told him that he wasn't supposed to be able to walk again. Uh, he wasn't supposed to be able to use his lower half. And he's able, uh, with the help of a walker and uh, stubbornness, to do that. And so I'm sure that there are days where that is hard for him. Uh, can continue to push through that. And I'm sure he's in pain that we don't experience on a regular basis because of that. So keep them in mind. Uh, reach out to them if you have a chance this week. Uh, I know they try to be pretty self-sufficient. They have family nearby. But we still want to uh, love on them and, and know that they are loved here as a part of our church. We're jumping into 1 Corinthians 6 this morning. And I want to read the, the uh, verses that we're going to look at this morning. <clears throat> Paul's uh, rather convicting here as uh, he continues uh, what we looked at last week. We've really kind of been looking at this the whole time. He's just starting to nail down specifics. Uh, Paul's been talking about their spiritual immaturity. He's been talking about their lack of spiritual depth. He's been talking about uh, their, uh, their inflation and, and really exorbitant views of themselves. Uh, he's been talking about all these different things, their obsession uh, with the intellect and worldly wisdom around them. And he's been working through some of these deeper issues that were like, okay, well, what does that look like? Well, what that looks like is sexual immorality in the church. What that looks like is um, frivolously suing each other for personal gain. And as he jumps in, we're going to start in verse 8 and look at uh, verse 8 through 11 here. Now, you yourselves do, or no, you yourselves do wrong and you cheat. You do these things to your brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. 
such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Father, as we jump into your word this morning, pray that you would help us to see our own sin in this list, even if it's not explicitly there, that there are things that we are sometimes still involved in that typified our life before Christ. I pray that you would help us to reflect on your mercy towards us uh, in salvation. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the reasons I, I, I played around with trying to, trying to come up with a title that explained this well, and I think God's mercy visibly displayed in you is, is what Paul's trying to get at. Uh, that, that transformation occurs uh, differently in different people, right? When, when a child comes uh, to faith in Christ, that can look a whole lot different from an adult coming to faith in Christ. And really the reason why is because we don't, we don't view a child's sin as heinous, as an adult's sin, uh, even though uh, we sometimes forget that all sin is the same before God and uh, that Christ has to save us out of sin and from sin no matter what age we're uh, at. And so <clears throat> as we think about this, um, I have a couple slides that work with this quote, but I'm reading more than, than what I have here, Avery, in slides. Uh, uh, this is a, a longer thought from Paul Tripp on this matter. Uh, and, and he talks about it this way. He says, we, we all do it probably every day. We have no idea what we're doing, yet it has a huge impact on the way that we view ourselves and the way we respond to others. It's one of the reasons that there's so much relational trouble, even in the house of God. Uh, what is this thing that we all tend to do that causes so much harm? We forget. We forget. In, in the busyness and self-centeredness of our lives, we sadly forget how much our lives have been blessed by and radically redirected by grace. That's the Corinthians' problem here. The fact that God has blessed us with his favor when we deserved his wrath fades from our memories like a song whose lyrics we once knew but now cannot recall. The reality that on every morning brand new mercy greets us is not the thing that grips our minds as we frenetically prepare for our day. When we lay our exhausted heads down at the end of the day for much needed sleep, we often fail to look back at the many mercies that dripped onto our lives from the hands of God. We don't often take time to sit and meditate on what our lives would have been like if the mercy of the Redeemer had not been written into our personal stories. Sadly, we all tend to be way too mercy forgetful. Uh, mercy forgetfulness is dangerous because it shapes the way that you think about yourself and others. And that's what the Corinthians are struggling with here. That as, as they claim and profess Christ as their Savior, they're falling prey to mercy forgetfulness here. And that's why he starts verse 9 and says, Do you not know this? Do you, do you not know that unrighteous people don't inherit the kingdom of God? Do, do you not... Remember that? Is that fact not in your, your consciousness? Don't be deceived. Then he launches into uh, the danger of, of deception here. Uh, Paul has argued that the reason believers don't go to court uh, and, and go to unbelievers with civil matters is because they're wicked and unrighteous. Yet, some of the Corinthians apparently don't think the spiritual condition of the judge mattered. But there should be a vast difference between how believers and unbelievers view their lives and their world. We become enamored, right? We, I find myself, maybe, maybe you're past this, you don't care, but I find myself enamored uh, with how to be successful in this life, right? And there's lots of people to look to 
to figure out how to be successful in this life. Lots of millionaires and billionaires that, that we could gladly look to and say, well, how did they make their fortune, right? How are they successful in this life? And we're drawn to that. And it's good for believers to want to be good stewards of the resources and gifts that God has given to us. That's not a bad thing at all. And there's even uh, helpful insights that you can gain uh, from these people. But often, I have to remind myself that uh, many of the millionaires and billionaires in our world aren't really considering how they can use their resources to advance the kingdom of God. They're not considering how to use uh, their finances uh, to bring God glory. Uh, they're not considering how to use that to be a blessing to others. That's not their goal in life. That's not the purpose that they spend 90 hours a week at their job, right? That, that's not the reason. It's much more focused on that person's interests. And so when Paul is, is asking this pointed question, what he's driving at is uh, what, what we know but needs to be confirmed again, that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. They are vastly different from us, or at least they should be. The unrighteous don't share the same focus in life. They don't share the same Savior. Therefore, they have a completely different worldview. Paul continues his letter then by listing uh, some of what believers in Corinth had been practicing before salvation. Now, let's look at this list because most of us would be repulsed to have friends that were practicing this. Um, fornicators, sexually immoral people, idolaters, uh, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, uh, thieves, uh, covetous people. Well, that's not as bad, right? Uh, drunkards, uh, revilers, that, that's somebody who is, is being verbally abusive with someone else. Um, an extortioner or a swindler, right? The, these kinds of people aren't normally welcome over to our house for Christmas. They're not welcome in our church because they're messy. And we look at that list and say, well, I don't see my sin listed, so I think I'm good, right? <laughs> uh, I'm not in there, so I'm fine. But as we look at the list, the focus is not on the sins. That's not what Paul's getting at whatsoever. The, the focus is that in verse 11, such were some of you. This is something that was in your past. And so, therefore, the focus is on the change that Christ has created in their lives that used to be typified by this kind of behavior. Uh, this used to be what defines you as a person. Uh, this is what you were known for, your reputation. This behavior was expected from you. We see a similar list, actually, in Revelation 21, 7 and 8. Uh, he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Uh, I know this verse actually really well because... Um, we all lie as children, and this was where my dad would take us to remind us that lying is bad, because it doesn't feel bad in the moment when it escaped me from a paddle. Um, but lying is what lands you in the lake of fire, because it's sin, right? Uh, we have other lists where it talks about disobedient to parents. And this is where I really think we, it comes back to that, that statement. We minimize the sins of children. Because they're not as heinous in our minds as the sin of adults. But all children are liars. All children are disobedient to their parents. Uh, as we look at this, this verse, it's condemning. Uh, and Paul's list continues to demonstrate to the Corinthians and to us how we're supposed to be living differently. Like this list isn't supposed to define us anymore. We're not to seek to blend in, but actually rather 
live out the contrast as a display of the gospel power of God in our lives. Even the Ephesians got a similar list from Paul with very much of the same message in Ephesians 5, uh, 3 through 6. There he, he, he says very much of a similar message. Uh, fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Uh, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which is not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Like, this isn't taken lightly. And apparently, if the early church could be deceived on this, maybe we can too. If we've got a couple different churches where they thought it wasn't that big of a deal. Paul's list includes things that we looked at last week and the weeks before. Uh, sexual immorality, uh, thieves and greedy people, swindlers, right? Uh, those are all issues that we've just seen. That They're cheating each other in court. They're being greedy for personal gain instead of seeking justice and retribution. Uh, we've seen the immorality in, in chapter 5. And we could argue that their inflated view of, of their spirituality was a result of idolatry in their hearts as they exalted themselves. And that's all the danger of immaturity in faith. But that doesn't mean that immature Christians are the only ones that are susceptible to this, right? We all have to guard ourselves against this kind of thinking. We have to be careful that, as we looked at on Tuesday, we've been discussing security of the believer uh, with eternal security on Tuesdays. If you're able to come, it's a wonderful study. We'll probably be wrapping that up this Tuesday. Uh, but we looked at this passage last Tuesday in 2 Peter 1, 9 and 10. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you'll never stumble. Why is Peter bringing this up? Well, he's the, the passage before this, you all know, add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, prudence, wisdom, brotherly love. That list is what he's talking about. And if you lack these things, you're short-sighted. If you don't think that you need to add these to your faith, you maybe have forgotten what you've been cleansed from. And that's the issue that the Corinthians deal with. And that's the issue that you and I deal with. Because we don't demonstrate mercy and grace to others because we think we've actually arrived. It's something that's actually quite convicting. Now, Jonathan started this morning um, praying in the classroom at the end of the hall. It's... It's something that we have to think about when we come to communion, when we come to God's house, when we interact with believers, that a lot of times I'm actually condescending. I'm a little self-righteous towards other people. I think that I do it better than you do. And we have to confess that because we're forgetting these sins that Christ has saved us from. So he transitions. This is what some of you were. You were washed. You're justified. And you're sanctified in the, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. In the midst of a condemning list, Paul encourages them by saying, this is what some of you used to be. Why should we not look like look to the world for judgment on God's people? Why should we not look to the world's opinion of, of God's people? Because th there's a difference between you and the world. Uh, God's mercy and your salvation and sanctification is the difference. Why do we do church discipline? Because you used to look like this, 
and you shouldn't still look like this. The gospel is life-changing. You've professed faith in Christ, and so it's not just life-changing, it's, it's actually destiny-changing. Like, we're going to a different place, and our path there is different from the world around us. Why don't we take each other to court, as he's talked about in the previous verses? Because you used to be greedy. You used to be swindlers. You used to extort each other. But God has saved you, and you now seek to live differently. You treat others with the grace that you've received from God. And that's what this passage is all about. This passage gives us hope and the promise of the gospel. That no matter what sin you have, no matter what you're living in, God can save you and free you from that sin. You were involved in adultery. Now God has saved you and freed you from that sin. You were a thief and God redeemed you. You were a homosexual, a drunk, a verbally abusive person. Now God has washed you, clothed you in righteousness, and adopted you into his family. If, if that's not something to rejoice in, but also something that we need reminded of every single morning when we're interacting with people, the, the question Paul is wanting the Corinthians to consider is, has this transformation taken place? Has there actually been a transformation in my life? Were, were some of them actually living in a way that they were genuinely not seeing a difference between themselves and the world around them? That, that's what Paul is trying to get them to see. Because if, if that's the case, one of two things needs to be addressed. One, they don't understand that the gospel is supposed to be life-changing. And, and so their future position and glory with Christ as a believer is also supposed to take place now, right? Like your life, it's not, oh, well, I'll be perfect in heaven, so we'll just glide till then, and we'll be fine, and God will, God will fix everything when we get to heaven. No, it's, it's supposed to be reflected here and now on earth. It's going to be imperfect, but it's supposed to be reflected now. So if, if that's one of the problems, and this transformation has taken place, then we need to consider that. And then secondly... This is what Paul's concerned about. They're deceived. Uh, do they have a false profession of faith? Or do they not understand? Have they, have they actually trusted in Christ? Or are they simply making a false profession and deceiving themselves and others? They need Paul to wake them up from this reality. And the Holy Spirit to work in their lives to help them see their deception, repent, and turn to Christ. That's why he says, some of you were like this, but now you're washed. You're, you're sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. This isn't something that you all of a sudden woke up another day and decided to be a better person. That's not what this is. It's not where you got up and decided, I'm going to turn over a new leaf and be better today. No. God is the one who washed you, justified you, sanctified you, put you in his family, and that was all accomplished through the Spirit of God. So, what, what is this application to us? Well, first of all, we have to evaluate. Do, do we forget how much our lives have been radically changed? I think we do. I think that's why doing this, where Paul is reminding the Corinthians, uh, why do I need reminded of what I used to look like? Why do I need to be reminded of what my sin looks like? Why do I need to be reminded that that kind of behavior is not allowed into the kingdom of God? Why is that a repeated theme throughout Scripture? 
because we forget how radically different and redirected our lives are because of God's mercy in our lives. So uh, one of the takeaways would be that God has blessed us with his favor. He, he has given us grace and mercy instead of wrath. And if you're a believer here today, we need to ask the question, am I guilty of the same thing the Corinthians were? Have you and I gotten so busy in our lives that God's mercy doesn't seem to look much different from the people around us? Perhaps the straightforward way to ask this question is, are you deceiving yourself? That's, that's a really hard question. Am, am I deceiving myself? Are you deceiving yourself? And, and when we look at our lives, we say, well, I'm not really that different from a good person in the world. That's a great question to ask. What's the difference between you and a morally good person? Society. So if you can't give the answer, there's a problem. The, the second takeaway would be that clearly there's supposed to be a distinction that should mark the lives of Christians. Uh, from their former lives of unbelief to their current professions of faith. So has this idea of mercy forgetfulness, has that impacted you and, and how you view yourself and others around you? I know it does me all the time. I, I find myself happily judging those around me as inferior to me and not gotten to my level. Uh, it, it's It's just... It's my self-righteousness, right? It's, it's, I, I love to appreciate how good I am. And when I'm doing that, I'm forgetting how bad my sin is and, and how much God's mercy was needed to save me. And then has that then turned into a struggle uh, because you've forgotten to reciprocate the mercy and grace that God's shown you and I in salvation. I struggle to show that on a regular basis, to show mercy and grace to others, because don't you get it? Don't you get it? Like, get it the first time and let's move on. And so to show mercy and grace and, and understand that every single day I'm sinning before God, oftentimes in a repeat habitual kind of fashion and God continually shows pardon, forgives my sin, and we move forward. We're supposed to imitate that to others around us. And here, believers weren't living out at the very basic level. They weren't living out their faith to others around them. And so this is what Paul has come to challenge them with. Father, this is not an easy task. It's not something that we can gladly walk away from and say, I've got that nailed. Um, we all struggle with this and we need your help. There's no way for us to easily evaluate our own lives and say, yes, I am deceiving myself. Yes, I, I need to grow in this. We all fall short. We are thankful that Christ's sacrifice for us is perfectly acceptable. I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts to help us understand where we forget your mercy and your grace. Where we are not treating those around us and we're not viewing ourselves in light of the sinful patterns of behavior that it infest our lives. I pray that you would graciously show us that and continue to mold us and conform us into your image because it's so easy to be conformed into an image of self-righteousness that we have made. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.